that song comes from a group called the Iona Community who live on a, um, a small island outside of Scotland. <clears throat> I'd never heard it before, but I, I believe that um, um, the music in between the verses was put there as a way to help you to meditate on the words that you just sang. So we'll have to sing it again another time so that we can um, know that as we start. <clears throat> Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. I invite you to follow along as we listen for a word from the Lord. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will govern my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. When they had heard the king, they went on their way, and lo, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, for you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me, just a second. <clears throat> I should have just been smart and brought it with me in the first place. Okay. Epiphany Sunday is one of my favorite Sundays of the year. And I think um, in America we... Um, we kind of like to leave Epiphany behind because we like after Christmas to get all of our Christmas stuff neatly packed back up and put away so that we can be ready when, um, when school starts back and, uh, and all of our schedules go back to normal. When I was in college, I traveled um, to Greece for our Jan one of our January semesters for three and a half weeks. And we got there the day after Epiphany and everything was shut down. They didn't shut down for Christmas Day, they shut down for Epiphany and celebrated it for like a week. There were uh, lights all over, uh, we landed um, in, um, uh, where were we, in Thessaloniki that first day and there were um, like Christmas lights like you would see here but they were put up for Epiphany so there were sailboats um, lighted up all along the shore, um, everything but the restaurants had shut down, there were, was no shopping open, much to the chagrin of many of my friends who wanted to shop as soon as they got there. Uh, but it was all shut down so they, they could celebrate and remember the, um, the Epiphany when the wise men came to visit Jesus. It's my favorite story, I think, for a number of reasons. First, I'm fascinated uh, by the Magi. We don't know a whole lot about them because scripture only gives us kind of vague references about them. So I'm just gonna tell you a few of the things we know. First of all, pretty much everything that you hear in the song we sang at the beginning, We Three Kings of Orient Are, is wrong. Um, there were not three. <laughs> we don't know that that's true. Scripture doesn't say that. So if you're ever taking one of those, how much do you know about the Bible questions, and it asks you if there are three wise men, the answer is always no. So you can get that question right from now on. That song is fun and catchy, and uh, you know we sing it a lot, but there are not a whole lot of biblical facts in it. It was, in fact, written by uh, an American pastor to be used in their church's nativity play, so I think he was a little creative in how he was writing it to make it fit with what they were doing. Matthew's gospel doesn't ever give us a number for the wise men. We use the number three because he names three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. 
Tradition has given the three wise men names. Um, Melchior, king of Arabia, who brought gold. Gaspar, king of Tarsus, who brought myrrh. And Balthazar, king of Ethiopia, who brought frankincense. It does not say that anywhere in scripture. That just comes from tradition. These three names actually come from a medieval legend. In fact, they didn't even appear in Christian literature until about 500 years after the birth of Jesus. So again, if you see them in a quiz about how much you know about the Bible, it's wrong to all of them. False, false, false. There are some scholars who think that the wise men were actually members of a Median priestly caste who rose to power in ancient Persia, which is modern-day Iran, for anybody who's really bad at geography like me. Their religion was founded around the 6th century BC by a man named Zoroaster. The Magi were held in awe as highly educated scientists of their day and scholars who could interpret dreams and control demons, and they watched the sky. Other scholars believe that the men were astrologists or maybe magicians from the ancient city of Babylon. The ruins of the ancient city of Babylon are about 50 miles south of the modern city of Baghdad. So if they came from Babylon, that means the wise men would have traveled to Bethlehem by way of what we now call the Arabian Desert through the southern part of the modern day country um, of Jordan. In 2004, there was a committee of the Church of England who was uh, revising the 2004 prayer book that they used for worship, and they suggested that the wise men might actually have been women. So they now use the term wise people. The committee said the term magi was a transliteration of the name used by officials at the Persian court, and so that the, they could have also been referring to women, so they used wise people. Okay, one more important thing about who these magi were. There is absolutely no evidence that they were kings, even though we call them that. Again, that is something that comes from the song that was written in 1857. So exactly who they were or how many there were, we don't really know. The little that we do know comes from the passage that we just read from the Gospel of Matthew, which simply tells us that they came from the east, that they studied the stars, and that they knew that a king had been born to the Jewish people, and so they came to pay homage to this new Jewish king. Now, the question that always comes up for me when I'm thinking about the Magi is, why did they come? One thing I learned uh, recently that I hadn't known before was that the verb that describes the arrival of the Magi might be translated more literally as started showing up which is different than any translation I've ever read for those words. And I think it can change our vision of what really happened. From scripture, it's not clear that they had an organized agenda or had traveled all at once. So if they started showing up, it means that they came at different times, one after the other. As um, one writer put it, their appearance sounds less like an official delegation governed by protocol and more like a viral movement. It reminds me of a modern day flash mob. Have you seen the videos from those where people just start showing up randomly? This verb also changes, I think, the interaction that they have with Herod that we read about because if they started showing up, then it also appears that they had not gone to Herod through the official channels first. Instead, they started showing up in Jerusalem and asking anyone and everyone about where the king of the Jews was to be born and what they knew. This also tells us something else about the Magi, that they had no knowledge of the current political situation in Palestine because they asked Herod where they could find this newborn king. If they had known anything at all about Herod and his jealousy and his fear of losing power and the political background, they would probably never have asked him in the first place. So the question becomes, why did they at first avoid the official channels? Were they naive amateurs who didn't know what they were doing? Well, we have to then think about the other things we know about them. We know that they brought gold and frankincense and myrrh, and those gifts suggest wealth and privilege and some understanding of how power works in their culture because you can't have wealth without an understanding of how power works. And the access that they eventually achieve, speaking with Herod himself, suggests that they are not just naive amateurs. So maybe they knew of Herod's reputation for violence against any he might think or perceive as a threat against him or to his power. Maybe they thought that by going around him, they would be safer and it would be better for all involved. Subversion may have been the safer path for them. 
So how Herod heard about the birth of the king of the Jews is unclear. Some think that he learned it first from the Magi, but it doesn't really clearly state that in the text. What is clear in the text is his response to the news. It says he had terror mixed with rage and that all Jerusalem was afraid with him. Now a clue for us in Matthew when he uses that phrase, all of Jerusalem, it really means the leaders in Jerusalem. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders of the temple, all of those people were afraid with him. So he gathers his religious experts to get the answer to the Magi's question about where this Christ king was to be born. And then he summons the Magi back to give them that answer along with specific orders to return to him and tell them exactly where this child was. Now, the word scripture uses to translate magi can also be translated as wise men, and that's mostly how we talk about them. And these magi certainly were wise. We know that from their actions. They were wise because they were not distracted at all by Herod's wealth and power and lies. They were wise because despite the humble circumstances in which they found Joseph and Mary and Jesus, they recognized right away that this baby, rather than the man wearing the crown in Jerusalem, was the true king. These magi really got it. More than 20 centuries have come and gone since the magi, being warned in a dream not to report back to Herod, decided to go a different route and return to their country by another road. They came to find him in a subversive manner, and they left the same way. I have a a friend who refers to the magi as ninjas instead of magi because of the way they come and go. It may even be said that in going out of their way to avoid Herod, the wise men were the first to follow the way of life that Jesus himself was later to lay out for his disciples in what he says and does during his ministry. In order for us to be wise in this world, I think we need to be more like the wise men. We can't be taken in by mere appearances. We can't take things at face value, that whole don't judge a book by its cover or a person's character by his or her clothing or level of education or size of their home or the flashiness of their automobile. We can't let ourselves be taken in by the many Herods of this world, those people who seek power, who cling to power, who worship power. And we can't be afraid afraid of change, of new things, of what God might be doing next in our midst. Or at least we can't be ruled by that fear. Because the Magi had to have been afraid, but then they chose a different route. Instead, we have to remember how Jesus admonished admonished his followers to pray in secret and to fast in secret and to give alms in secret, how he advised them to follow the secret way of believing in what is right and doing what is right, rather than just doing things for show or to attract the favor of fashionable people. That's what the wise men did. They left their gifts for Jesus, and then they craftily snuck out of town. They didn't go back and tell Herod. And think of the opportunity that that could have been. If they'd told Herod about the Christ child's whereabouts, they could have leveraged that information for more power and more political clout and even more money than they came to Bethlehem with in the beginning. Instead, they choose to leave in a way that pointed not to them or who they were, but to the nature of the Christ child. In order to be like the wise men, we must do the new things that God calls us to, even when we're afraid of it. I think we have many members in our church who are like the wise people. Those whom Jesus praised as his followers, they are not flashy people. They aren't people who exist just to put on a show for others. They are people who really believe in doing what is right and upholding one another in Christian love. They do things in secret, in quiet, so that their work doesn't point to themselves, doesn't give them more power or prestige. They do it in a way that points to their love of God and their love of God's people. And as a pastor, I am thankful to have so many people like that in our congregation. It makes me proud to be a pastor at Epworth. You can just think about how much our church has accomplished in the last year. Mission trips without the leader, they went anyway. Work camps helping neighbors right here at home. Tons of jobs around our church property, many done in secret without people knowing. Some done before the request could even be made. We've helped so many families this year through our discretionary fund and our Christmas tree angels and Thanksgiving bags. We've brought children and families closer to Christ through Sunday school and children's ministries and VBS. We fellowship together and worship together in powerful ways. We've had over 
over 40 people in Bible study. And in the year, uh, in the two and a half years since I have come here, we have welcomed over 20 people to be in our membership. We have a lot to give God thanks for. The list is far too long for me to share all of it with you. But know that I am grateful and proud to be the pastor here at Epworth. The, disciples, the wise men didn't all live and die 20 plus centuries ago, nor did they all come from the East. There are wise people everywhere. They live here in our community. There are wise people who know the way that leads to life, to the way of Christ, and the true way of love. There are wise people sitting right here in our church every Sunday morning. This is the time of year when people make resolutions. New Year's resolutions, we make a lot. Is anybody making a New Year's resolution this year? Just raise your hand if you're making one. Ooh, not very many, or not very many people who will admit to it anyway. I always struggle with New Year's resolutions. Um, usually, the ones we make have something to do with our physical appearance, like working out more, or eating better, or being healthier, or about some deficiency that we feel we need to work on. And interestingly, if you look at the statistics, most people don't keep their resolutions. By the end of January, they are forgotten, pushed aside for the other more important things that creep up in our lives. I wish I could have found you a specific statistic to tell you how many people keep their resolutions, but I couldn't find one. But I can tell you from my own little mini survey that is very unofficial, that only about 5% of the people I know have kept them or met theirs from last year. So this year, I'm going to encourage us to take a different tact on making New Year's resolution. Now, as a pastor, I believe very firmly in the power of words. In the 10 years I've been in ministry, I have watched words change people's lives, either for the better or for the worse. And we know that about our children, right? When you say words of encouragement and love to them, you can see them change and grow in new ways. And when you say words that are hurtful and mean, you can see them shrink. A friend of mine wrote um, a blog post uh, recently, and in it she said, um, don't be your child's first bully. I've been thinking about that for two weeks since I read it. Don't be your child's first bully. So I believe in the power of words. So this year I'm asking you to also believe in the power of words. We're going to hand out after communion today some stars that have words on them. And we're going to ask every person to take one. It's not one per family. It's one per person. Kids included can take one if they like. And they have words like um, praise and education and empathy and vulnerability and love and peace and gentleness and leadership. And we're going to ask that you take this word home and that you begin to pray that God would teach you something from this word this year. Put it somewhere where you'll see it, on your bathroom mirror, in your car if you drive a lot, maybe uh, in your Bible so that you can see it when you read your Bible, wherever it is that you will see it frequently. And during the year, we're going to come back to these words and ask what God has been teaching you. Maybe it will be just an affirmation of something God has already taught you that you can share with us, or maybe it will be something new that you learn about the word, some way that it's interactive with what's going on in your life. So we will begin to share those as the year comes, and then at the end of the year, we will celebrate the way that God has used these words to change our collective lives together. And then in January, you'll get a new word for 2016. Now, I um, printed out 150 of these stars, and I only cut out maybe about 100 because my hands started hurting. So there are some at the bottom that aren't cut out all the way. You can either take them home and paste them like that, or you can cut them out the rest of the way uh, when you get home. But based on attendance, we might probably have enough of just the cut out ones this morning. So let us pray before we begin communion. God, we thank you for the power of words in our lives. We thank you for the words of our loved ones that we remember that have encouraged us and taught us and helped us to be better. We pray, God, that as we seek you this year, that you would help these words to change us also. Use them to encourage us, to edify us, to change us, so that we might be more like the wise men who came and worshipped you and then went and shared it with the world. For this we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen.